What's up, everybody? Today we're joined by Mr. James Winupe, Managing Director of Alan Gray. And my first question to you, sir, is please give us a little bit of an introduction and explain to us how a man from Tanzania worked his way up in the Namibian corporate ladder. John, thanks so much for having me on the it's spot. My pleasure. I'm a big fan. I'm, you know, I'll subscribe <laughs> to your channel for sure. So guys, hit up John. Um, um, you know, it's it's my story is kind of an interesting one, uh, and I guess everybody's mm. is. Um, yeah. But if I if I was to sort of tell you where I came from and how I got here, it's it's really predominantly on the back of, to be honest with you, my mom. So, mm -hmm. like her her absolute sacrifice, and this is almost cliche, like everyone says this, but like that's my life, like. My mom sacrificed a lot for yeah. us to get here. Uh, I remember once when we were in school, she actually sold her car to pay for my school fees. Oh, wow. Um, and I look at all of us here today and I wonder, geez, how many of us would actually do that for, for the kids? So she was a woman with a vision, um, a great passion and, and a set of aspirations for her children. And so no doubt when somebody believes in you that much and sacrifices to invest in you that much, um, it's hard not to, to try and repay them. Yes. And you can never fully repay her, but certainly to reciprocate uh, the manner in which she conducted herself. So my mom was a lecturer. Um, she sort of moved from Tanzania to Kenya, even to Namibia, to start up new departments in universities. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when she came here, uh, she started a Department of Fisheries and Natural Resources at UNAM with a grant from Norway. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, her little chicklings, you know, we yes. just followed her around everywhere. And everywhere she took us, she just tried to give us the best education and she tried to, to be the best role model she could be. Yeah. Um, and that's it. Oh, that's yeah. very interesting. I mean, I just, I just, when you said that, something just struck me. You're like the only managing director of an asset management, or let's rather say a managing director of an investment firm that's driving a polo. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what's the thought behind that? Are you really taking this value investing thing that seriously or? Yeah. So the polo um, is value investing to a certain extent, yeah. but it's actually predominantly just build your balance sheet. Uh -huh. um, and I wasn't always like that. So, you know, when I, um, I worked really hard and I got a job at PwC at one point in yep. time and I started making decent money. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my first salary was like 72K for the whole year. And cool. so by the time I sort of, you know, finished my article, I was like, oh my gosh, I was making decent cash. I had two cars at that point in time. <laughs> I had a Peugeot 307 Cabriolet, like automatic <laughs> rooftop, yeah. red with like some crazy exhaust. Um, and then, you know, not long after that, I bought an R32. Oh man, uh, <laughs> You know, like the 2008, whatever it was, I yeah. think it was the Mach 5. So it was uh -huh. pretty as hell, double pipes. Um, and I was, you know, I was a young guy, I was single, it was fantastic, right? But every time I looked at my, um, my, my balance sheet or, or my income statement at the mm -hmm. end of the month, it, it was just like going nowhere. Yeah. In fact, as I started getting more and more into investments, uh, I sort of put an actual personal balance sheet mm -hmm. and I had a net negative uh, asset value. I had net <laughs> negative book value. Wow. And that's not very hard for most people to achieve these days, yes. because if you think about it, you know, your cars keep on depreciating in value. You probably have some overdraft or a credit card somewhere mm -hmm. uh, and you, your salary comes in and goes out. Yeah. Like how many of us actually try and put meaningful money away to save? Mm hmm. Especially in the movie, I think a lot of people are indebted, you know. Correct. It's, it's so I sort of problem. looked at that and I was like, yo, how am I working at a place where I'm trying to create long-term wealth for people and I'm not practicing the same? Yeah. So I sold both my cars and then I drove this other old 1.4 Polo for like, I don't know, however long. And I started taking my excess cash and I started piling it into assets. Right. And, you know, I mean, today my balance sheet is like 14.6 times greater than it was at that point in time. That doesn't say much. I'm not saying my balance sheet is big. I'm just saying- I was I about to ask what the exact number I is. I ain't gonna say that, but <laughs> I, I, I have made progress since 2010. Oh, congrats, that's good. Um, and I think anyone can do it. It's really yeah. like a, and, and so the, the reason I'm driving a Polo now is because I'm still building my balance sheet. Yeah. Um, look, my, you know, the other car is a Tijuan. So I, I bought that because there's a baby involved now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, so I can't be, uh, I can't be, you know, squeezing my baby in the back of yeah. a polo. But uh, at the same time, that balance sheet has to keep. Going. And you know what? I actually like it. Um, I think it's it sends a, an interesting message to 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 young people and to anyone. Like you don't have to conform. Yes. To society's expectations yes. of you, you don't have to be this tall. You don't have to be this flashy. Yeah, of you course. Can just go about doing your thing. Yeah, you'll right. be okay. Yeah, no, I'm inspired. I must say, <laughs> you know, I, I want to get that TSI as well. Hey, Excel is all you need. 
<laughs> balance sheet income balance statement. Balance sheet income statement. Go and see what yours yeah. look like. Yeah. So the other question I wanted to ask you, which is, I think this one's a lot more closer to me. And it's a bit more personal. We could have sp- uh, spoken about it uh, behind the scenes, but yeah. I think I want to throw this in here. So as an investment professional, I see many of the, especially if it comes to analysts, most of yeah. them have CFA. In your humble opinion, yeah. do you think it's better to, to get the CFA or CA to enter the investment arena? Right. Um, or a master's even. I mean, a lot of people yeah. are talking about MCOM investments. I, I like the fact that you gave me two options because I was going to throw yeah. you a curveball and give you a third one. <laughs> so yeah. so I started off and, and I finished my CA in, in 2010. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty useful, right? Because a lot of CFA and a lot of investing involves being able to read a company story. Yes. And a company story, of course, is an annual report. And hopefully you do that over many years. Um, but the, the crux of that story is contained in the, in the financial statements. Yes. So being able to understand how the financial statements are put together, the accounting policies really helped. Mm-hmm. Um, when I did my CFA, it, it really just took that, uh, the, the ability to understand the story to the next level. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you then started, you know, the, the reason I, I did accounting for nine years and I was never the wow. biggest fan, right? <laughs> uh, and why, like, so what, why do I say nine years? When I was in high school, I dropped accounting. I hated it. And I, you know, no, no, <laughs> no, no, offense. Uh, no offense, Mrs. Daniels. But um, <laughs> I took it up with a great teacher called Mrs. Jenkins, uh, history that is. Yeah. And when I went to varsity, I was doing a BBA and I was just like, this degree is going to take me nowhere. So I changed my, my degree halfway through my first year to accounting. Mm-hmm. And my mom thought I was nuts. She was like, are you sure you just dropped this thing a few years ago? To her credit, she backed me, did four years yeah. of that uh, and then three years article. So mm-hmm. like, and, and then two years on it. So that's, that's the yeah. nine years. But the CFA allowed me a lot more subjectivity, creativity and leeway to express myself yes. and express my opinion on a set of numbers. Whereas accounting, mm-hmm. obviously th- there's some, you know, leeway to wiggle, but it was very rules based. Mm-hmm. So I enjoyed CFA and I started being able to value companies, you know, look at the economy before I express an opinion yeah. on, on, a, on, on, a, on a stock or, or bonds. But the, the thing that I did that I thought gave me the most value with investments, believe it or not, was CFP. So, right. so CFP, for, for those who don't know, yeah. is, is, is a certified financial planner. And the reason it, it really sort of touched me more was CA and CFA are very mechanical, right? It's all yes. about the numbers. It's... You know, sure, you can add some ESG component, environmental, social mm-hmm. and governance to, to add like the pollution and, you know, uh, yes. corruption or mis- mis- mismanagement of, of assets. But CFP made it super real. CFP says, who's John mm-hmm. Morgan? Yes. Um, how old are they? What are their dreams and aspirations? Are their liabilities dollar based or rent based? Uh-huh. Um, and then they sort of look at, OK, well, this guy, he has an estate, right? So he wants to put some money for his kid. Uh, he has risks, he can get hit by a car, or his car can get hit. So you have yes. long term and mm-hmm. short term risks. Um, and at the same time, he has to live in Kali's world. So you have to consider his tax profile. Um, and then, you know, he has a portfolio of stocks that he wants to grow. So you have to look at his, his investment. Mm-hmm. It was dope. It just brought yeah. everything I did together, right? The tax from the accounting side. Yeah. Um, the, the investments from the CFA side, the risk was a whole new area for yeah. me to go and explore medical, short term, long term. Um, and then like the case studies just had like human beings in them. Mm. That's but interesting. this person who passed away, this person who's disabled, this mother who got yeah. divorced, like it, it, it just really rounded it off. And it just makes you look at investment. The, the thing I, I, I love, Yes, you need, it, it makes you look at it with such a human angle. Yes. Um, and it just made me want to help people. All right. More, so oh, that's the first time I've actually heard that recommendation, CFP. As yeah. so, just to play devil's advocate, if you, if, if you have an, an, a candidate coming into your investment team, yeah. they don't have CFA, they don't have CA, they have a bachelor's degree, of course. I mean, that's a minimum requirement. Yeah. And they have CFP. Yeah. Would you put that candidate above a candidate that's, let's say, CFA level two, level three? Right. So if if a candidate came and they had neither of everything you just mentioned, uh-huh. but they they were like a medical doctor or a mm-hmm. physicist or some crazy thing like that. They they've been running a personal portfolio for like three, four, two yeah. years, and they're crazy mad about investments. That might be a much better candidate than somebody with a CFP, a CA, right. who is like potentially disillusioned. 
Uh-huh. They don't know what the NSX is or like they're just not uh-huh. into investment. So like, that was great. like our, our CIO, um, Simon Murray, you can uh-huh. go check him out. The guy was like a, a physicist or something. Wow. He had like a doctorate from Cambridge. He was super smart and analytical, but he was really, really passionate about investments. Okay. And Alan Gray saw the guy and, um, you know, the guy, the guy, the guy became one of the greatest chief investment officers Alan Gray ever had. So, so I would argue the key element Mm -hmm. to be successful at our firm anyway, is a, like you need to be performance driven. Mm -hmm. You need to have a passion and an appreciation for meritocracy, right? Yes. Um, and then you just need to be quite passionate about investments and you need to have quite an analytical brain. Mm-hmm. Um, you have those components, you're off to the races with whoever has whatever qualifications, right? Right. And then, you know, we'll go through the interview, get to know you and, and go from there. Right. Okay. So I think the next point is very important for me yeah. to also understand because this is something, it's, it's brand new in Namibia. We haven't seen this before. JPF has allocated um, tenders to new up-and-coming Namibian asset managers who are supposedly purely Namibian asset managers so that we can manage our own money, correct? Absolutely. So this is good for the country, I, I'd assume, and I'm, I'd assume you'd agree. But for Alan Gray, if you would take the Porter's Five Forces, this is technically you know, an increase in the threat of new entrants. And um, I just wanted to know, how do you and your team deal with it directly? Right. So it's not, it's not even an increase in the threat. It's a realization of the threat, yeah. right? So... Right. You know, one could look at it and say, oh, man, like that's that's a bad thing. The truth is competition is good. Yes. And not just um, saying that, but it's great for the consumer, right? Of course. Because yeah. these, you know, the two sort of that I've seen out there have already put out like unit trusts. Mm-hmm. So the average consumer has greater choice. Mm-hmm. In theory, you know, in a typical market, it should compete down prices um, for the service offerings. Um, but you also mm-hmm. get more variety. So it's deepening our capital <coughs> markets. It's, it's deepening um, the asset management fraternity. If you're a young guy at Vastri, you now have a greater option yes. in terms of where to go. Um, so personally, I think it's great. And you know, they say iron sharpens iron. Of course. So if they do a fantastic job and give us a run for our money, I think that's fantastic. Would they, would they um, potentially even influence how we run our business going forward? Absolutely, right? Like we're not static. Um, we'll evolve. Maybe, you know, we'll look to build a bigger Namibian presence and compete better. I think yeah. it's it's great of the GAPF to do that. The key thing would just be to avoid what we've seen happening in South Africa, for example, even Botswana, um, where things just don't get done above board. So yes. for as long as we're transparent, um, mm-hmm. we're honest, and we avoid you know bribes and corruption yes. and all that kind of stuff, we could be writing a really really good story that we can all be very proud yeah. of. Um, and you know, uh, my kid could be working in any of these firms. Wow, that's a great so, response. Yeah. Great, great response. So in terms of differentiation, since we're speaking about competition, sure. I've been looking at most of the, <clears throat> the fun facts, you know, even of South African asset managers, it seems like everybody's doing a value approach. Sure. You know, so it's, it's either going to be value with momentum. So it's value on a catalyst, basically. Sure. So if we have a basket of new asset managers, yeah. And we know Alan Gray is typically, you know, the king of value investing. You know, you guys have the longest track record, etc. So... What are you guys going to do to compete directly with them? Because something clicked with me when you said um, that it's going to bring prices down. Are you actually planning to, to make your products a bit cheaper? <laughs> Is that how you're going to compete directly? You know? So... Look, fantastic question. Yeah. So let, let's try and, and, you know, that question is multidimensional, right? Because mm-hmm. our value proposition is, is multidimensional, right? Yes. So uh, what do I mean by that? Let's look at our investment philosophy, right? Yes. It, it's people typically do put us in this category where we're, we're value investors. I've seen a, a matrix from a financial consultant mm-hmm. and uh, they tried to plot Orbis's portfolios once in, in three grids, uh, four grids. So sort yeah. of um, like big companies or small companies, value growth. And over time, actually, we plotted right across that particular spectrum. Interesting. And guys like, oh, we thought you were value managers. We aren't value managers. Uh, okay. What we are is we are investors who are obsessed with finding stocks that are trading below our assessment of intrinsic value. Done. Okay. Right. And I can give you two very, you know, sort of material examples in our portfolios that in theory are on different ends of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. NASPAs, you would struggle to call that a value stock nice growth. in anyone's book. That's yeah. uh, in theory, that's all growth. And then if you look at Sussel, on the other hand, that's like, <laughs> You know, that, that thing was like hitting 260, it's trading on, you know, five times yep. our estimate of normal earnings. That thing looks like value. Both of yep. them 
are in the top 10 of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Um, look, we spend a ton of time trying to say, what should this company be worth through the cycle, given its quality management, its ability to deploy cash flow into its market segments and extract decent returns on investment, mm -hmm. right? We then obsess about trying to find out uh, about all of these dynamics over like three or four, yeah. uh, two or three months as an analyst, you present that at a policy group and we debate this thing. Nice. Um, and so once we're fairly comfortable with, we think this company's worth $3, then we turn our attention to, but what's the market saying about this company? Mm -hmm. There are times the market is super optimistic and it's you know trading at five, so we put that aside. And there are times the market is super pessimistic and it's trading at one. Yeah. Uh, and then we do some more work to try and understand a decent margin of safety and, and put a, because we're humans, so we make yes. mistakes. I mean, our long-term track record, like success rate of about 66%, Brilliant. two yeah. out of three. So we get things wrong too all the time. And so we try and, and uh, uh, sort of compensate mm -hmm. for that hum humanoid uh, element. Mm -hmm. And then we, we make a call and we make a call with conviction. So, yeah. so one of the things that differentiates us is exactly that. We, we don't fit into any one mold. Mm -hmm. We are obsessed about finding cheap stocks. Yes. Um, and then the <coughs> other is if you just look at our company, you know, we're managing, I think, 500 billion rand or something, but uh, as a group, Mm -hmm. But we only have like nine or 10 unit trusts, right? Which is very different. So the way in which we deploy capital is a way in which we think about funds. Mm -hmm. Conviction, we don't spread our bets. We don't have a, a value fund, a growth fund, a property fund, a resource okay. fund. We have an equity fund that we think if, if a client wants exposure to equity, they can put money in that fund and we should be able to find good ideas for them everywhere. But coming back to sort of what else, you know, how else do you differentiate yourselves? Uh, to be honest with you, in terms of price, we have looked at our fees. They have evolved over time. Yes. Um, on our offshore side, we have a really interesting uh, fee called a refundable reserve fee. Okay. Uh, and essentially, you know, as we do well, it's a performance fee. So there's a, a small base fee, but as we do well, we take that excess alpha and we put it in a reserve, like a bucket. Okay. Yeah. And if we underperform in the future, we actually refund our clients. Oh, that's clever. Um, and if we do well, the money goes into the bucket. I mean, that, that was almost, I think, unprecedented on a global scale. Yes. So that's a very interesting sort of fee model. Um, but in Namibia, and it's available in Namibia, would we come in here and try and crush prices to, to win market share? That's definitely not our style. Yes, of course. We obsess about aligning our interests with our client, right? So if our fee model speaks to, if I do good for John mm -hmm. Morgan, then I do good. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how we think about fees. Um, and then lastly in Namibia, yeah. I think the big thing for us would be, um, for me personally as yes. an MD, if I want to sort of leave a legacy, I would just really, really love to to make sure that we have a strong local investment team. Yeah. Um, and I think we can do that. And and uh, you know that's I'm sort of cooking up something for the next. You know I have to think about what the next five years yeah. should look like. I'd really love a strong of set of Namibian investment professionals. Of course. Um, and heck, I might even throw my hat in there myself and see if I can. Oh, you have to. You're job. a CFA charter holder. We need. I mean, what we have less than twenty charter holders in the country, right? That's true. We have you a know, few. It's, it's, and it's you know, important. that's where my career started. My mm -hmm. career started as a trainee investment analyst. Actually. Interesting. I started yeah. as an equity trader. There you go. <laughs> Our CIO started off as a as a fixed income trader. Oh, nice. Right. And the, I mean, he yeah. was just fixed income, and now he's a chief investment officer at Alan Gray. Interesting. So, so there's growth. Absolutely. So there's one thing that's just stuck in my head now. If you look at the South African landscape, yeah, mainly because my universe personally doesn't really, ex it doesn't go past South Africa because sure. you know I don't have the capital requirements to go offshore yet. But um, most of these countries are notorious for poor capital allocation sure. and even fraud. Just off the top of my head, I think I did a podcast on Sassel and yeah, Sassel and Aspen before. So Sassel, Aspen, and um, yeah, I think let's go with the two of them. Both, of, even Anglos, Anglos did the same thing. Sure, they acquired assets um, at the wrong time. Yeah. So basically, they took up a lot of debt. They became highly leveraged. Demand fell, and they had to start writing off these things. And a lot of them are cutting dividends. Um, those are very big companies that most of these asset managers invest in. On the yeah. fraud side, we had Tongat recently, the sugar company, and uh, Steinhoff. Steinhoff. Nobody would forget Steinhoff. And Braid is even on the rocks as well. So, how do you guys? Um, I would be really interested to know how do you guys account for that? Because I think this is something that's very particular to South Africa and not so much the rest of the world. Sure. Um, if you if you do invest into South Africa, how would you hedge against these type of things? Because right. that seems very difficult for me. 
It is, especially um, because, you know, the, the craft that we're in relies mm -hmm. on publicly available information, right? Yes, so of course. So it's, it's not like you can go in there and start kicking desks in a, in a company. <laughs> yeah. You can do that a little bit on a side visit. <laughs> but, um, I mean, and, and you know, why stop at South Africa? You know, let's yes. try and, and go local and global, right? We can start off. I mean, if you look at local, what happened, mm -hmm. say, with Bidvest was an interesting story for yes. me, right? Um that was a company that potentially got derailed because of uh, inappropriate sort of behavior um, by by various sort of parties. If you look mm. at Sassel, for example, um, you know what they did there. Th there was poor cost control, poor allocation of capital. Sometimes etc. Steinhoff was just pure fraud. Yes, and you know even if we go overseas, there were you know pharmacy pharmacy uh, uh, farmer companies yeah. that were massively increasing prices. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that was just eye gorging consumers. Yes. So let's take all of those, right? Uh, and, and it's useful to know that these things happen locally, regionally, and, yes. and globally and internationally. So yeah. as an asset manager, what do you do? And that's where for us, we look at what is our job? Mm -hmm. Our job is to create long term wealth for John Morgan mm -hmm. on a multi dimensional basis, like I said. So Yes, the price is one, the, the service uh, that mm -hmm. he would get when he comes to office is another. Mm -hmm. Picking a cheap stock is the main component of that. But that's not where you ha you can stop or you should stop yes. in order to do a good job for John Morgan. So mm -hmm. you need to go into to, to this side of the of the field. So you look at environmental, social and governance issues. Mm -hmm. Sassel is the largest polluter in the world. Um, the farmer companies uh, that were eye gorging, you know, consumers with really high prices that had a huge social impact because yes. you were denying people affordable, uh, uh, decent access to, to medicine. And then if you look at Bidvest, you know, that potentially just involved uh, sort of in, like counseling the state on, mm -hmm. on policies that were harmful to local pensioners. Yes, of course. So uh, say Sassel, for example, after we <coughs> went through all of the financials, we looked at what happened with your co cost allocation. We actually approached the board as Alan Gray, because yes, we were one of the largest yeah. shareholders. We approached the board and, and we relayed our fears uh, or at least our concerns with a few other asset managers. And we said that we thought to see, well, one of the things we were concerned about was the leadership structure. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, together with other asset managers, the result over the long term was that those two CEOs left together yes. with a string of other senior managers mm -hmm. at the firm. I'm not saying that's just because of us. I'm saying yeah. we were concerned about those and we had to take what people would typically call an activist's role. Yes. Um, and we engaged the board and that specific leadership change at that firm unlocked some value for our, for mm -hmm. our clients, right? So Sasso was at 260, it went up to 290, even touched 300 mm -hmm. post the removal of the CEO, right? So. That's that's why I'm saying our value proposition has to be multidimensional. Yes. You don't just sit there, build a model, um, it, and yeah. then and then buy a stock and wait in the room for the for the share price to mm -hmm. come closer to your intrinsic value. You have to be active in engaging the people who are managing the business that your clients own. Because we don't buy stocks, we buy pieces off yes. businesses on behalf of our yes. clients, and we have to be uh, significant custodians uh, for our clients. And I think that's that differentiates uh, us quite a bit relative yes. to even pretty large asset managers. And I suspect that uh, there's a great opportunity for us to do more of that in Namibia. Um, mm -hmm. And it'll differentiate us against some of the new incoming guys as well. Um, especially in Namibia where, you know, there's so many policy changes at the moment, Reg mm -hmm. 13, uh, you know, we're going through a bit of an economic yeah. crisis. Um, so, so where we can, and that's why I'm happy to serve on some, some of the panels I yes. serve on is I know that in order to do a good job for my clients, I do also have to be engaging the policymakers yes. to try and help them make uh, pieces of legislation or policy pronouncements that are conducive for long-term wealth creation for, for Namibian people. Of course, just speaking of that, um, all the panels you're sitting on, let's just, let's just hypothetically say one day you have the power to influence every public policymaker. Yeah. <clears throat> if you could give five recommendations... Yeah. to this country as a whole. Like, it does not have to be limited to Bank of Namibia. It doesn't have to be limited to the presidency. You know, it's literally any public policymaker in this country. What yeah. would these five recommendations be? Wow, five. That's like you a know, bunch. Because, I mean, I mean Namibia is, we, we're, we're pretty much, we can 
three. I mean, if you have no, three sure. robust ones, sure, it should sure, be sure. fine as well. Yeah. We, we're pretty much in a, in a rut, I think. You know, negative economic growth, youth unemployment. These yeah. are the things that are pressing. And yeah. it's difficult to see how we're going to get out of that, Right. To, to be honest. And Absolutely. Yeah, the policies, I don't know if the policies are, are robust enough or if it's execution or capital allocation. I'm not too sure what it is exactly. Cool. I think, I think opinion. the first thing, the first uh, mm -hmm. piece of policy I would, uh, I would ask them to think about mm -hmm. is to uh, infuse humility into everything we do. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's policy or that's advice, but like, yeah, that's what do I mean by that? Like infuse humility and servanthood into everything that we do. So of course, as Africans and, you know, I guess as a people of any country, you're proud. Mm-hmm. Right. And you want to own everything and everything needs to have your stamp, that sort of thing. And, and I would ask us to think about that yes. for two seconds. Um, and I would encourage us to seek real, authentic assistance um, in trying to put together some of this. And so don't just go out there and, and hire a consultant, but really look at what can I do and what can I not do? Uh, and I'll give you now some some mm -hmm. decent practical examples. Um, I, I, for one, I mean, I'm one of 22 members on a high level panel. So this is just mm -hmm. my opinion. It's not the high level panel's opinion at all. I, for one, think that we need to relook at our balance sheet as a, as a country. Remember, I had mine when I was like, yes. I don't know, you know, <laughs> 20 something. I think we need a strong, had honest look at ours as yes. a country, right? And on this side, we have a whole bunch of liabilities, our bonds, um, and, you know, our, our duty to look after our people. And on this side, we have a whole bunch of assets and the opportunities to do a good job at this. And sometimes people just look at this and they just see their ability to tax yes. as, as the key driver of your mm -hmm. ability to raise money to look after your people. Mm -hmm. But we also have other assets on here. We have MTC, we have Namdeb Holdings, we have a whole bunch of government buildings that we put up um, post TPEG, which was kind of like our growth initiative. Yes. But we, I mean, a big part of what we built were government buildings and they're not productive assets. Could you turn these three, for example, into productive assets, even NWR? You could. Uh, let's take the government buildings, right? I, I think we should securitize them. Alan yes. Gray is not the poorest company in the world. We don't own one building. Mm. We don't. Mm -hmm. We rent. Long-term rentals that are bespokely driven, uh, built for us and our needs. Why? Because we are asset managers. So we focus on growing investments for people and we let Growth Point handle mm -hmm. our building. Cracks, painting, maintenance, generators, the works, right? We have people within the firm that look at facilities and they interact with Growth Point, but we don't get into it. So mm -hmm. why should a government, for example, that has all these obligations to provide schooling, health, and perhaps we're not doing a great job at this, should we be also property managing? If not, if maybe we shouldn't, let's take those buildings and let's securitize them, right? Yes. You're, you're sort of a guy who's yes. into research and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Take the buildings and securitize them, put them together, put them uh, in an instrument and ask Growth Point, Oryx, Vukile to bid on this thing. Yes. To say, okay, here's a bunch of buildings, you bid on them, you buy the buildings and you have a tenant and a pretty decent quality tenant. I mean, government is not going anywhere, right? Of course. So when you do that, you unlock significant cash flow and liquidity on your, on your balance sheet, right? You go from owning a whole bunch of buildings that require maintenance that you're hoping will appreciate in value for what purpose? Mm -hmm. Like what are you going to do with office buildings that have appreciated in yeah. value? And you turn them into liquidity and cash and you can use that cash to do a few things. So that's one. Let's go to Namdeb Holdings. Uh, you know, Reg 13 says we need to bring a exactly. whole bunch of money back to buy local assets. We don't have a whole bunch of listed exactly. assets. Standard yes. Bank did the best it could. Uh -huh. Hopefully MTC lists. But Namdeb Holdings would be a gem to hold yes. as Namibian people. If you really want to do broad-based empowerment, and you want people to own the assets and the resources of their country, mm -hmm. what better company to own than Namdeb Holdings? Both, and, and I mean right at the holdings level, not just Namdeb yes. or Deb Marine, at holdings level, because that's 50-50 government and the beers, right? Yes. List a portion of that. Government can, you know, give up 5 or 10%, I don't know if the beers would, and list that. Let pension fund money, Namibian money, 350,000 yes. people mm -hmm. who have $200 billion to their name. Because that's mm -hmm. the thing with empowerment is 
you know, you go out there and you say to a guy, great, I want to give you an empowerment, I'll put you into an empowerment transaction. He normally doesn't have the capital. Then he has mm -hmm. to go borrow from a bank. And then when you do a rights issue, he can't follow his rights because he doesn't, he or she mm -hmm. doesn't have the money and then they get diluted. Here, they, 